Now it's my pleasure to introduce to you another old friend, Marcello, Marcello Lupi. He is at the Università della Campania, Luigi Van Vitelli. And we've known him, I've known him many years. He's worked in Cambridge, Cambridge, England. And uh, he is a, a Sparta expert. He's amongst a small uh, a group of hippies who work on uh, ancient Sparta. And in 2017, he published Sparta Storia e Rappresentazione di una città greca, which was reprinted in 2021. And he's going to talk to us about the Spartan army at Plataea, demography and tribal order. The floor is yours, Marcello. Thank you, Paul. I will try to share my screen. Yes, thank you, Paul, and thank you, of course, uh, to Natasha for inviting me to this uh, terrific conference. I will start recording, to myself at least, the totally shareable observation that Paul Cartledge made yesterday about the numbers in Herodotus and on their often dubious uh, reality. In the paper on Sparta Manpower, and the units of Spartan army, numbers are, of course, a large part of it. You will judge if I make an acceptable use of them. Anyway, there are two figures. There are two figures that are the basis of any reflection on Spartan manpower in what we could call the pre oligantropic age, that is the period before the mid 50th century when the um, number of Spartan citizens began to decline sig significantly. But these two figures are provided by Herodotus. In a well-known passage, the exiled Spartan king Demaratus, immediately after the sacrifice of the 300 at the Thermopylae, states that the the Spartans had had 8,000 men similar, homoioi, to the 300 dead. That is another 8,000 Spartan citizens of the military age. Um, well, uh, as Demaratus makes clear, uh, one has to add uh, uh, to these 8,000 the periocoi, but this is a different, uh, different matter. The other figure, Herodotus 9, 10, and 12, concerned the, troop, the Spartan troops at Plataea. The regent Pausania, in addition to being the leader of the entire Greek army, led with him 5,000 Spartans, as well as an equal number of periochi and the mass of allots, of which the very doubtful number of 35,000 is indicated, seven allots for each part. Anyway, Herodotus adds that the 5,000 Spartans were the youth, neotes, of Sparta. The use of the term neotes here is clearly informal and should be considered with caution. Certainly, it does not refer only to ne the neoi, the young people 20, 29 years old. The most widespread interpretation with which I also agree is that the mobilization on the occasion of the Battle of Plataea consisted in a mobilization of, the, of two thirds of the army. The mobilization of this kind, in fact, is attested for the Peloponnesian army in several Thucydides passages that refer to the first 10 years of the Peloponnesian War. And no doubt, a mobilization of two thirds implies that the third third who remained at home was made up of the oldest men, those closer to 60 years old. On the other hand, we know from Xenophon that still in the fourth century, the, the military draft was based on the age, that is by calling up a certain number of age classes, 10, uh, 15, 35, starting with the youngest age class, the one constituted by the 20 years old. Thus, despite the vagueness of the term neotes, it is, it is generally accepted that the Spartan conti contingent in Plataea was made up of the old citizens' army except the senior uh, conscription classes. 
we may have doubts about which were the age, uh, the age classes that constituted the first third and which those of the second third. Personally, I believe that the first third of the army in, in, included the, the real Spartan youth, the 20, 29 years old, that is those within which the elite corp of the 300 horsemen were selected. While the second third included the men 30 to 45 years old, but this is a secondary problem. What is important and that the scholarship has generally emphasized is that there, there is a coherence between the number of 8,000 Spartan citizens of military age after the, after the Thermopylae and the fact that uh, 5,000 Spartans, uh, at, uh, the 5,000 Spartans at the Plataea were the two thirds of the mobilization men although approximately the two numbers converge, hence the widespread consensus toward this theory. I will return to the relationship between these two figures later. For the moment, it is appropriate to go ahead and, uh, and uh, to address the question of uh, how the 5,000 who fought at the Platea were organized. That is, uh, within which units they were distributed. A consensus also developed on this issue in the second half of the last century. It was believed, as some still believe, that in the years of the Persian War, the army was organized differently from, from what happened in the archaic period when the Spartan army fought divided into three large units each expression of the three Dorian tribes of the Elias, Dimanes, and Pamphilo. So in fact, a fragment of a Tirtaeus, of a Tirtaeus elegy clearly attests. According to this theory, the, um, this tribal army was replaced probably during the, century, the sixth century by the so-called Oban army. That is an army built around the Obai, the alleged five territorial subdivision or villages, which are believed to have constituted the city of Sparta. Each of the villages would have provided one of the five units, the Lorcoi, which, according to some scholastic and lexographic sources, formed the Spartan army. Later, the Oba army would, would, uh, would then have been replaced towards the the middle of the fifth century, that is after Platea, by a different organization of the army, which is the one we find in Thucydides and then in Xenophon. However, several recent studies have questioned this consensus. And, and uh, it is uh, became clear that the, weak, uh, that the weak point in this reconstruction is the alleged Oba army of the five Locoi. It is uh, not uh, necessary it's not necessary here to repeat what uh, some scholars, uh, Nigel Kell and, and Hans Van Bess, have uh, very convincingly demonstrated. It is enough to say that the names of the five locoi that we find in, in the scholastic and the lexicographic sources do not recall in any way the names of the Spartan villages. And therefore, the relationship between the villages of the city and the five locoi is completely Evanescent. In particular, we do not find them among the names of these five locos the Locus Pitanates, which is the only one attested by Herodotus in the relation to the Battle of Platea, and whose ex existence we should add to see this denied. As is well known, Pitane or Pitana was the best famous Sparta village, but in various later archaic and 50th century sources, that is the sources previous or contemporary to Herodotus, Pitana is just a metonymic expression to indicate the entire city of Sparta, so that the existence of a Pitanates locus does not mean the existence of a noble army of five locus. Anyway, I do not intend to repeat here since I have already dealt um, with it as well, my personal opinion on the locus of Pitane, which uh, Natasha has kindly uh, recalled yesterday. 
nor my opinion on the alleged Spartan, five Spartan village. But since the matter of villages has been raised incidentally yesterday and uh, today, just before me, I just observed that no ancient source ever attests these five villages in the sense that no source claims that the villages were five. This is an idea that uh, developed in the late 18th century, and since then has been accepted by almost everyone as a matter of fact and never questioned. But the notion of the five village, believe me, has no basis. And uh, stop here about uh, the villages. Eventually, we can speak uh, in the discussion later. What instead I would like to talk about here is, uh, is the following. If in Plataea, the Spartan army was not distributed in five locally, if indeed, as Catherine Crimes already wrote over 17 years ago, the five locally are inconsistent with everything that can be discovered about the Spartan military organization, well, how was the Spartan army organized at Plataea? Well, um, the removal of the five locally involves a relevant chronological consequence there is no longer any reason to exclude that the tripartite structure of the army testified by Tirteus could, could still constitute the basis of Spartan military organization in 479, and that the Spartan army of Plataea could reflect the division of the Spartan community in the, two, in the three Dorian Fulai tribes and their internal subdivisions. About this, it's worth, uh, it's worth to stress that it's precisely in the years of the Persian Wars that we find in various uh, authors, as Pindar, Aeschylus, a particular emphasis on the Dorian, on the Dorian features of, uh, um, of, the city, um, of the city of Sparta, and in particular with army. And this suggests that the army may have been at the time still structured on the basis of the three Dorian tribes. Aeschylus' reference to the victory of Plataea as a libation made with the blood of the slaughtered and obtained by the Doria spear, today finds a more pregnant integration in the papyrus fragments from Simonides' poem on Plataea, the so called New Simonides. Uh, in one passage, uh, fragment 13 West, despite uh, the extreme incompleteness of the text, it seems to catch reference to the deployment of the armies in the plain, Espedion, of the Hasypus. Here we come, we come across on the one hand, the, the Medes and Persian, and probably in front of them, the son of Dorus and the Heracles. In other words, that the text um, does not limit itself to assert that the Spartans were Dorians, but it indicates that um, the entire Spartan army through an expression fitting to an army still distributing the three uh, tribal units of the Demoness Pamphylia Iles, as is known, the son of Dorus, are, Demanes, are the Demanes and the Pamphilo, whose names derive from Demon and Pamphilos, uh, the alleged sons of Egemius, son of Dorus, while the Ileis descend from Hillos, son of Heracles. So, in a way, Simonides is saying that in front of Midas and Persia, there were the three Dorian tribes. I admit that a poetic fragment. Uh, moreover, more incomplete is not enough. So let's try to go back to the 8,000 Spartans mentioned by Herodotus. I, do, um, I, I don't think that anyone has ever questioned the origin of this figure. Yet it's a figure that raises some questions. In the politics, Aristotle refers to 10,000 Spartiates, the 10,000 Spartiates of the ancient times. Uh, but it's clear that the term used, Muroi, is at best 
as uh, Paul remembered yesterday, a very general approximation. Similarly, Plutarch's figure of uh, 9,000 partites is related to the notion of 9,000 clairoi, the plots of land which were distributed to the citizen, a notion which, however one may interpret it, could reflect the triadic division of the Spartan institutional organization which takes the form of three tribes, 30 elders, 300 horsemen, and precisely 9,000 plots of land to be assigned to as many Spartan citizens. So at the best, these two figures are just notional numbers. But just because apparently unrelated to pre-established schemes and converging, as you have said, with the 5,000 parties at uh, Platia, the Herodotus number of 8,000 adult male citizens of military age has, seem, has seemed reliable. In my view, anyway, the question is, uh, what are the sources that would have allowed Herodotus to place the, an apparently reliable figure on the mouth of the exiled King Demaratus? It is likely that some memory was preserved of the consistency of the contingents that in Plataea had withstood the epic force against the Persian invader. Much less, however, that the memory was preserved of the Spartan forces which could, which, which could be mobilized in 480. And it's true that, uh, as Paul just said, that Herodotus visited Sparta but it was there a few decades, uh, decades after these events when a radical democratic transformation of the citizen body had already begun. It is also to be excluded that Historia may have had access to something similar to a, to a census with which certainly will never have, have been held in Sparta at this time. What I intend uh, to show or at least suggest is that also the figure, the figure of uh, 8,000 mobilizable men is a conventional figure, a notional number based precisely on the knowledge of the Spartan mil military structure during the years of Persian, Persian War. There is a text which uh, more than any other can offer valuable suggest valuable suggestion, although it entails that uh, for for some minutes, we move away from the battle of Plataea. It is a fragment. It is a fragment uh, of a work by Demetrius of Skepsis, taken from the first book of his work on the Trojan Battle Order. Um, let's take a look at this text. It says that among the Spartans, the festival of the Carnea is an imitation of a military training. There are places numbering nine and these are called shady places, schiades, since they bear some likeness to tents. And nine men eat in each, and everything happens through the commands of a herald. And each shady place holds three fratries, and the festival of the Carnea is held for nine days. It's not easy to assess the reliability of this antiquarian source. Its chronological framework is not immediately clear. It might be excessive to assume that uh, the ritual described by Demetrius belongs to the period of the origins of the festival of the Carnea, which the Spartan um, scholar Sosibius belong, um, uh, fixed during the uh, 26th Olympiad in the first half of the 7th century BC. Nevertheless, in general terms, the almost obsessive emphasis in this text on the number three and its um, uh, multiples, nine shady plays, each containing three fratis, making up a total of 27 fratis in the eight one man, not only belongs to a Dorian ideological horizon, but uh, it is a uh, uh, but no longer appears by the end of the 5th century. Uh, moreover, 
as an explicit imitation of military training, the ritual can be seen as a microcosm of the Spartan organization during wartime. Even the expression, everything absent through the commands of a herald is a reference to military organization since we know that the movements within the phalanx, within the Spartan phalanx were given verbally by the Enomotarch, a specifically Spartan commander. If, says uh, Xenophon says, if he were a herald. In short, this passage from the Demetrius of Ascaps is consistent with the with the Tirteus, uh, the elegy of uh, Tirteus previously quoted, in portraying a structure of the army, uh, which can probably be attributed to the archaic age and reveals a clear military function of the civic subdivision, both of the tribes and of the fratis. Mm, we can note, uh, moreover, that uh, Tirteus states that the uh, warriors of each of these three tribes fought Choris, that is in separate ranks. Uh, well, since the ritual described by Demetrius is said to imitate expressly military training, it's reasonable to assume that the people who banqueted together in each shady place also fought together. In other words, each group of three fratis whose members shared the same tent belonged to the same tribe. The framework that emerged from this text is uh, disarmingly simple and is based exclusively on the, on the principle of the gradual segmentation of larger entities into smaller units. The community of Spartans was organized into three Dorian tribes. Each of them was divided, divided into three intermediate units, which manifest themselves in the nine shared places described by Demetrius. Each intermediate unit was, in its turn, divided into three fratis. There were three tribes, nine intermediate units, and 27 fratis. If all this makes sense, we must deduce that the distribution of the 81 men according to their tribes and their fratis must reflect the distribution of Spartan warriors at the time when the festival took on the form described by Demetrius. It is certain, it's certain that in the second half of the fifth century, when the, um, when the Battle of Mantinea in 418 was afoot, the Spartan army was organized very differently. But there is no reason to believe that in 479, when the number of Spartan cities was still a large number, the structure of the army was no longer the Dorian one, the tripartite structure. And then I came to the question of the 8,000 men. Why each fratry in the ritual described by Demetrius is represented by three men and not just by one? If we are faced, as everything seems to indicate, with a microcosm of the Spartan military organization, the only possible answer is that each fratry would provide three army units, each represented by a man. So it, it seems almost obvious to, have, to draw the conclusion that these three units, including men belonging to the three different moments, to three different moments in life, the youngest, the oldest, and the man in the middle, according to the logic of the three tools that he had uh, already illustrated. The immediate consequence of this reconstruction is that the Spartan army in the age of the tribal order was made up of, of 81 units, which uh, as it is known, um, had far to subdivision since the basic unit of the Spartan army was the Enomotia. But what about the name of these 81 units Spartan and how many men each of them included? The most likely hypothesis in my view is that the units were called locoi. We must remember that Thucydides is in fact the only author who refers to a, Spart to a Spartan locus, the, the refers that the Spartan locus included more than 500 men. Not surprising, several scholars have pointed out that the cities may have called locus the unit which was called um, was called, or at least Xenophon calls Mora. In Xenophon, the Spartan lot on the fourth century 
as well those which made up the army of 10,000 mercenaries described in the Anabasis are always made up 100 men. In this perspective, the question of the, uh, the locus of Pitane, it exists or did not exist, end up disappearing. If it was a unit of 100 men, it evidently escaped the attention of the Cedars, who believed that the locus were a body of a much greater number. And it can bear, and this is my opinion as I, uh, I said yesterday, it, it can be reasonably assumed that the locus of Pitane consists of the 100 men generally placed to guard the king and explicitly mentioned by Herodotus in his sixth book. In any case, from all this, from all this, it, uh, fall, it follows that the Spartan army had about uh, 8,100 men, uh, 100 for each of, uh, of uh, its, uh, its units. This is obviously a conventional number. And it's possible, for example, that the 27 units made up of the older men were not able to supply all the men required. But this is a, few, this is a figure particularly close to those of uh, to those uh, eight thousand uh, Spartans were still available after Thermopylae. And this is, in my view, the origin of the number. 8,000 in Herodotus 7, um, 234. I know, with numbers, if you, you use them approximately, you can prove anything, anything you want. It's more than uh, legitimate to raise doubts. However, once put, uh, put aside the notion of the five locoi and the five villages, which never existed, the interpretation Offer the uh, seems to me the most reasonable speculation. And allow me, in conclusion, to, co to go back here to, the, um, to 2,501 years ago. When he had to choose who to take with him to the Thermopylae, Leonis selected 300 men, 300 men who, Herodotus informs us, all had children. We must really imagine that Leon has chosen, perhaps personally, these 300 fathers of families. Or it is not much easier to assume that he has chosen three units, three locoi, each of 100 men. Choosing father of families means that he selected the three locoi not among the units of the youngest, nor obviously among those of the oldest. Rather, he will have selected them from among the 27 units made up of men who were over 30 years old and therefore had or were about to have sons and were nevertheless still part of the youth, the neotis. With these 300 dead, Sparta could still count on about 80 units. Two thirds of them, approximately, uh, 5,000 men of 50, we, if, uh, 51 locals, if we take into account the 300 fallen at the Thermopylae, fought and won in Plataea under the command of Pausania the regent. Some of them died, but the speaker who preceded me have already written many papers about the fallen and their burial. And so, thank you very much. Grazie mille. Thank you very much, Marcello. Lots to discuss there. I don't see, oh, I have, let me have a look in the Q&A. No, nothing there. No um, raised hands. Uh, Paul Christensen, are you not dying to come back? If you aren't, I'm very happy to start off, but I don't want to usurp. Uh, my no, please get started. I, I'm largely in agreement with Marcello about, so. Ah, okay, right. Well, I'm not. For, for, <laughs> there we go. For all sorts of reasons, uh, including interpretation of the wording of Demetrius of Skepsis, but I'm not going to impose my views. What I'm going to do is uh, impersonate Moses Finley. And um, one of his uh, tactics after hearing maybe a brilliant talk like Marcelo's was, 
Marx would say, so what? So what? Because he was, of course, uh, a New Yorker. Suppose you're right, Marcello, that in 479, they're still fighting in three Dorian tribes. I'm not going to go into all the issues of how many villages there were, on which I disagree with you um, quite strongly. But so what? Therefore, what does that tell us about Sparta? That it's massively conventional and traditional, that it has always fought since the time of Tertius, 650, to the early fifth century in precisely the same fundamental organization. Whereas Athens, late sixth century, huge reform, both constitutional in the sense of political institutions, how people were appointed to office, how decisions are made, and military, because tribal. Now, my old teacher was not Finley, as some people have mistakenly thought, but de Saint-Croix. And he was particularly keen, as he saw it, on an evolutionary development, in, in particular late archaic Greece, generically, from what he called genetic tribes, that is, you claim really to be related by birth to your fellow Fulatai, to political tribes, which are explicitly artificial, and they're designed to fulfill a function which overcomes the defects of supposedly genetic relationship. And in the case of Athens, of course, you have 10 tribal regiments to correspond to 10 new artificial tribes. Now, those of us who believe in an obol army saw that as one answer to this problem that arises if you stick with a purely genetic model, births don't always work out brilliantly. How do you absolutely ensure equality of numbers and equality of status, equality of sentence? on the basis purely of birth. Well, according to your picture, Marcello, looking at Sparta in the round, that suggests Sparta's terrifically old fashioned and that it's not moving with the times. It's not, is that your view? That's, that's all I'm asking. Okay. Uh, I don't think that Spartan uh, is a city that uh, does not move, does not change. Uh, it changed in many ways. And uh, by, by the way, uh, I, I think that the, the, the three Dorian tribes are a, a totally artificial construction. They are not a, a memory, a, a survival of some uh, uh, very old structure. Also, the three tribes are a, um, are a um, artificial construction. Um, yes, so society changes, but once in Athens, for example, so once you uh, Christians uh, instituted the ten, uh, the 10 tribes, they uh, stayed for a long time until the Hellenistic time. So I, I, I do not find uh, reasonable to assume that the structure, the three tribes, in my view at least, born in the, not before the, the 7th century, was still in force at the beginning of the fifth when the demography, the manpower of the Sparta was not changed significantly. After, in the middle of the fifth century, things changed. Changed and uh, the structure uh, changed. So, so this is at least my opinion. Fair enough. Thank you very much. So we have uh, Yanis, please. <clears throat> so Herodotus tells us that a thousand men reach and uh, cross uh, the Isthmus, a thousand Spartans, before the rest of the army. And supposedly those are the youngest ones who got can uh, travel faster without the baggage train and all. Does this number, which would be one eighth of the whole army or one fifth of, of the um, army in campaign, in this campaign, fit into the, the, the age group organization? Can we link the two? Uh, yes. It, it, it was usual that some part of the army was uh, um, was uh, 
uh, send in advance respect at uh, the rest of the um, uh, of the army. So I, I of course, uh, probably the younger, the youngest, but uh, yes, Herodotus unfortunately does not say um, more on the on this topic. Even at Thermopylae, uh, uh, there was a total Greek force of 4,000 uh, 4, uh, warriors, of which uh, only 300 Spartans. But then other men uh, um, should, uh, should arrive. Uh, in particular in Sparta after the celebration of the Carnea. Anyway, uh, yes, I think that uh, a part of these 5,000 were sent as an advance of, uh, of, the, of the army. Thank you very much. Uh, Natasha. Uh, yes, thank you so much for this uh, incredibly interesting talk, Marcella. And I think I'm very convinced by the broad picture that uh, sort of like your uh, main sort of thesis. What I am uh, curious about is uh, when you say that Leonidas could just choose three locoi, so three kind of, okay, let me, let me see what I find interesting here. Uh, I think it actually connects to the same conversation we have been already having uh, in uh, relation to Paul's uh, talk, because um, when Herodotus in uh, Book 7, uh, 234, which you just quoted, says, says that, okay, well, those 300 died at Thermopylae, but uh, there at home we have 8,000, which are all exactly the same level, right? So, I mean, not Herodotus, but Demaratus. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, what Herodotus himself uh, would concur. So like, so Herodotus has this very strong uh, egalitarian agenda uh, for Sparta to come through. But when you think about Leonidas and choosing people on a sort of dangerous mission, would he be choosing just sort of like automatic division or would he be choosing uh, people who are particularly good? And, you know, I am, I'm sorry, apparently I'm just like right now a little bit obsessed with hippies and people <laughs> who could be ex-hippies because I think it just like very on my mind. So uh, when, um, uh, when uh, Thomas Figueroa was making a, uh, an argument that uh, those would be um, quasi hippies, I think what he meant is that those people could have been previously hippies. And I, I actually find very interesting what Paul just said uh, about hippies being sort of like fast track into the uh, sort of figures of authority and kind of close to the governmental structures in Sparta. So I am I'm curious how this competitive ethos would be uh, superimposed on this very egalitarian ethos that you have just described. Okay. Well, um, of course, I don't know if uh, if uh, Leonidas uh, ch chose the the three hundred among the. Uh, exit pace, uh, those who have been. I think uh, just that, that there were, uh, as, as, as I said, there were seven, 27 uh, locoi of a man of more than 30 years old, until 45 probably. And probably three of them uh, on which uh, Leoni has uh, had some uh, uh, fiducia. Um, he was uh, sure about them, but I, I I'm unable to to uh, to to give a a real uh, answer to your question. There is a, a this egalitarian ethos uh, imposed on uh, on the Herodotus narrative that. Uh, um, makes it real difficult to, to 
to, to, to answer, okay. Actually, so I'm, I'm super sorry to turn out of, uh, speak out of my turn, but it suddenly occurred to me that when we say somehow like, uh, you know, good schools are in wealthy neighborhoods. So some neighborhoods in Sparta could have been much sort of like, like much more aristocratic and producing much better quality warriors, like, you know, uh, combining the- Yes. Yes, so, I, I I would agree, but I I um, yeah. I just thought it might be worth mentioning one particular case, which I'm sure you all know, but Plutarch's Apophthegmata. It's about Pydaritos, and when he was dis not selected, he said, "I'm really pleased because you know what? There are 300 men in Sparta better than me." Well, he might have been crap. But at any rate, he pitches up. He's a real person in Thucydides. So uh, there we go. So uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Bardinas. How are you doing? <clears throat> I guess this would make that serpent call a lot easier to understand. Nothing else with the three tribes. Uh, but my actual question is, um, did I understand you correctly that, that you're envisioning locoi that are homogenous by age group so that there are a body of locoi that are all the men are between 20 and 30, and then other local, all the men are between 30 and 45? Or, yes. or are they integrated within local? It's, it's yes. interesting yes. to me, but I'll let you, I'll let you. Exactly, I think that there were uh, one third of the local of young men until 30, one third of over 30, and one third of the senior. Uh, evidently, within each, each each locus, uh, there was uh, a difference of age, men of uh, 20, 21, 22. So, but, sure, sure. Uh, sure, sure. yes. No, that's interesting though, just because in terms of combining the manpower, having younger men and older men in the same file essentially would be advantageous. And it would also make sense when you're drawing up more age groups, that's how you get deeper files because you're bringing more men into the units. But the other thing is that I've always looked at that as a sort of a model for how they later would incorporate perioic units. So if, if you're seeing completely distinct age groups, then we're probably talking about completely distinct Spartan and perioic units. So that's, that's just why I was curious if you were seeing this as completely homogenous units within age group. Uh, generally, generally, it's assumed that uh, the Periaka was integrated in the, in the Spartan army only, mm, only in the in late fifth century, I think. So when uh, the structure of the army was uh, clearly different from the, uh, the one uh, I have tried to describe, the, okay. the Dorian one. So the Periaka in At Plataea, as we accept what Herodotus says were uh, a different corp, uh, corpus of, of the army. Right. Okay. So, so this, this homogenous age grouping by Lokoi then you think breaks down in the, throughout the fifth century? Uh, the, the age group during the fifth century, uh, not totally. Because the, the structure by a, a two uh, thirds, we find it also in uh, in um, in Thucydides for the Peloponnesian world, and then also in Xenophon, it's uh, it's in several passages you find that the uh, ten age classes younger or the fifteen uh, that is uh, twenty to thirty or twenty to uh, thirty five were. Uh, uh, sent uh, for particularly dangerous mission or something. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, the, the logic of the age, as uh, probably in any army in the world, as always uh, a, a way. Sure. Yeah, I guess my, my only concern is that either as a homogenous unit or as parts of other units, but, but yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, Chris Toplin. Yeah, um, can, can you um, can you articulate how how the freighters relate, if at all, to the Lokoi? That's one yeah. of the features of of Demetrius um, 
little schema is that there are things he calls freight trays. Yes. The freight trays uh, were um, nine uh, for, 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 for each tribe, for each tribe. Yes, yeah. of course. Of course, I, I, I also think that so, the so freight... Each, so each set of Lokoi for each age group has three sub has three tribal subdivisions. Oh, I'm no, I'm just struggling no, to, to, no. to to work out the the, the, no, no, the, uh, the uh, maths and geometry, so to speak. But a bit, I mean, I wonder how important would the freighters be in terms of 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 defining the military units, or are they in fact not important? I, I um, no, they they just uh, they just uh, gave the man they have three locos one uh, of different ages, but uh, no, just that. They were, in my view, uh, a subdivision of, um, of the tribe. For each tribe, nine uh, uh, fratis. Each fratis uh, uh, provided uh, three locally. This is my reconstruction. Right. I see, okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, Yanis coming back? Yes, I would like just like to remark that in uh, yesterday's talks, uh, in Michael Charles' talk uh, about the, the serpent, and we talked about how that looks a lot like a Spartan design of a monument, and we wondered about the not only the tripod, okay, the tripod is of course linked to Apollo, but why the serpent would have three heads, and there's now we hear about this connection or possible connection with uh, the Carnia who vaguely have some connection to Apollo as well. And the numbers three and the numbers nine, and then this repetition of the number three and what uh, the three heads could mean, of course, it's not actually a question, but it's a remark that I, I just made. Okay, it's an interesting uh, suggestion. Thank you. So you'd like to receive that um, with warmth, Marcello? Or... <laughs> yes. Okay. So now we're supposedly having a panel discussion, which I think we've already broached, but perhaps I could ask, um, it seems invidious, but um, Paul Christensen, does your Sparta at Plataea resemble Marcello's? Um, yeah, I think. I think Marcello's, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for Marcello, so let me I, I'll tell you what I understand him to be saying. Right. Um, that I think he's art, articulating one way this, the citizen body could have been divided for military purposes uh, based on the idea that the Dorian tribes were constructs that were created at the time of the Lycurgan revolution and that they were ramified in a particular fashion based upon multiples of three, um, all of which seem uh, entirely reasonable to me. I don't think that has any necessary ramifications for how Spartiates interact. It's just a question of how the citizen body is subdivided. I'm, I would say that I, I I'm convinced about 85% of it. I, I guess I don't I'm a little skeptical about military units being formally divided on age basis. Uh, I guess the question is, is there any obvious parallels for, for that on an army-wide basis in Greece, where I think there's that more of, I think, and I would not construe myself as an expert, more of an emphasis on distributing experience amongst the group as a whole. So, um, but, that's, I think, a relatively minor piece. What I did want to ask Marcello about was um, how, um, and I may have, I was taking notes, I may have missed something in here, um, uh, how that works with these, the, the, the groups of 30 that Herodotus talks about. Becomes. <clears throat> the Tricades, which yes, are, have always guys. been sort of a mysterious group, but I, I'm curious as to how that fits together with your schema. No, no. Uh, I have no an answer. I have no idea about the Tiacades. Um, Hans Van Ves' uh, suggestion could be accepted, but I have no idea. I mean, Tiacades uh, recalls 
free, of course, but uh, yes. Uh, mm, maybe Trikas could have something with uh, some relation with the pace, but I don't want to, to stress this point. Okay. okay. Can I ask you also, uh, how, and again, I may have just not connected this, but do you see an integration between this system of organization and the Sicitia? In one way, yes, there was a, a, an integration. If the man who uh, fought together in battle really um, ate together, uh, had dinner together in the Sicilia, the, some relation uh, uh, should have been. Uh, it's, it's very, we know from Plutarch that uh, 15 people, 15 persons, uh, had dinner at the Sicilia together, and uh, some relation one could one could find this relation. But I, pre precisely in in which way uh, I, it's it's very difficult to say. Okay, a reason I ask is in part because I think there's a strong sense that the Sicilia were purposefully mixed age groups, right? So that yeah. people were elected into them. So if there's a mixing of the age groups at the smallest unit level, then I'm not sure then how the units could then be recombined in a way that would make them age group homogenous at the larger level. Okay, yes, but this, mm -hmm. uh, this is Xenophon in uh, chapter five of, uh, I think, of his, uh, uh, of his uh, constitution of Spartans. And uh, in, um, I, I have no doubt in any case that, uh, um, that there was a, a strong, um, we have not spoken about the enomotia, but surely the enomotia has all the uh, the age classes from. Uh, so uh, there was a transversal integration, in my opinion, between a structure on uh, between the two structure. I mean, uh, so. But okay. Uh, the, okay. Uh, I, Thank you. Just to circle around, I would say that I'm totally sold on everything except the age group division okay. at the that the units were divided by age group I, it just seems very hard to sustain a military unit in that fashion uh, but you know Thank we you. are clearly in the realm of opinion here and i'm willing so that the other 95% i'm totally sold on so <laughs> thank you